All successful investors have a set of filters which they use to select their stocks. We take a look at finding stocks that benefit from high barriers to entry. Nick Norman-Smith is our expert on this. He's Chief Investment Officer at Lentis Asset Management. Welcome, Nick. And I know one can always go in-depth with you. And I, Warren, I can spend hours, well, he can spend hours with me talking to me about these wonderful topics. So this is presumably, as a value investor, this is pretty important to you, to find these stocks that, that benefit from a high barrier to entry. Now, you can start off by explaining to us what they are, cause, and I'm sure there are, are barriers to entry that we wouldn't even think uh, as being barriers to entry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, if we take a step back and, and look at very, very basic sort of economics 101, if you get a sector of the market or a set of companies that are making super profits, really, really make a lot of money, obviously that's going to attract more people in there. That rising competition is going to erode profit margins because as you have more competition and more fighting, um, you, you can make less money, you've got to charge the consumer less. Um, so what you want to do as an investor is find a company that has a barrier to entry, so something that prevents everyone from jumping in. So if we, if we look at the most broad example, a farmer. If there's a massive demand for tomatoes uh, at the moment, all the farmers go out and they plant tomatoes. It's relatively easy, you know, you buy the seeds, you, you grow them. And then what happens next year? There's so many tomatoes, the price comes down, you don't make so much money, people pull out. So it, it's the supply and demand dynamic. If you can find a business that people can't just come and replicate, that's, that's when you're really going to find a, a successful business. There, there are a number of different barriers um, to entry across the market um, in, in sort of broad industrial companies right up to technology companies. Come on, give us some examples. I'm just thinking the obvious example, cell phone companies. We've, we've seen how difficult it is for new entrants to make it. Absolutely. So let's look at why. Well, one is capital. You need quite a lot of money to, to set that up. But Capital is relatively easy to come by. Licensing, getting the licenses, that's probably the biggest. Then you've got um, existing assets. So you, as a cell phone company, once you've got all the towers out there, um, it's very difficult for someone to come in and just switch on tomorrow. They need to, to build this out there. So, um, but having said that, the problem with barriers to entry is virtually any barrier will eventually get broken down. And we're seeing it in the, in the cell phone industry. So some of it's been regulated away. You've also got people who said it putting up you know, Wi-Fi towers. So people now don't need the cell phone company. They can just go into a Wi-Fi hotspot, that kind of thing. So it, nothing is certain in life. But if you can find these kind of uh, businesses, you know, they, they're generally going to generate higher returns on capital and, and be around for longer. Nick, we've uh, seen the U.S. reporting season and we've seen some of the tech companies that have uh, disappointed in terms of the, the expectations around what they were going to deliver via earnings for the quarter. But some great examples of uh, barriers to entry that you've mentioned in this. Two companies I'd like you to comment on. One is Microsoft. They've just released uh, Windows 8 or they're about to release Windows 8. Tell us why, why is that such a great uh, what have they got that's yeah. made that co company such a great barrier to entry? Okay, so there, there's probably two key, if you want to sort of use the theory to a headline. So one is network effect. So what a network effect is, is every additional user makes the network more valuable. So let's look at the fax machine. The first fax machine that came out, well, who did you send a fax to? It wasn't really that valuable. And the more people that had it, the, you know, the more valuable it became. And that's the same with, with Microsoft's product because everyone... Uh, Everyone uses Microsoft Office. Most people use Windows. So the compatibility mm. is so wonderful that, that, that I'm really going to struggle to, to move. So there's a massive network effect there um, that, that gives Microsoft the ability. I mean, let's be honest, their products haven't been the greatest products um, around. But yet, they have something like 90% of the, of the browser market. And, and, and high customer switching costs is another one. So once again, I don't want to use Star Office Excel or Star Office Spreadsheet. I want to use Excel because I know when I send you my Excel document, you can actually read it. And the power of that is massive because humans are inherently not very keen to change. So if, if you can find something that locks them in there, you, even if you have a poor product, you can keep people going. All the better. So it's literally the network effect for Microsoft. But if we look at another technology company like Apple, uh, which seems like it doesn't have too much of uh, a barrier to entry in terms of making the actual products, but perhaps the brand 
uh, is the barrier to yeah. entry. What's your brand, what's your thoughts there? Brands are strong and they they barrier to entry to a certain extent. But as we've seen with companies like Nokia and various others, a brand can lose popularity very very quickly. Apple does have people locked into a certain extent with their with their very good iTunes um, media infrastructure. Um, but but uh, that's a valid point, and that is the big concern with Apple. Do they have a really big uh, barrier to entry? They've got a very small portion of the market. They make a lot of money um, charging a hell of a lot for, for a piece of hardware, effectively. And as we've seen now, what's happened? Google have bought out Android. Microsoft have b are, are launching Windows 8, which is a tablet-focused system. Um, we, we are seeing a lot of competitors out there. And, and that's going to once again erode the margins because people will suddenly realize, well, yes, Apple's a great product, but actually the Samsung Galaxy is, is pretty cool. Windows Phone looks like it's finally actually going to be a quite a decent product. So, yes, Apple might be better, but am I willing to pay two or three times the price for something? Uh, yes, some people at the high end maybe, but, but the masses aren't. Just in terms of this, uh, the barriers to entry, uh, we've, we've mentioned some of the technology companies. You know, Coca-Cola, is that another one that, that's, that, that has a barrier to entry? And if so, what is it? Because I know Coca-Cola is a great brand, but is there anything else that, 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 that seems to protect its earnings almost mm -hmm. regardless of what PepsiCo does? Yeah, it's, is it's it a recipe? Or? Yeah, it's a, f it's a fantastic <laughs> question. So undoubtedly the brand I is a big thing. You know, Coca-Cola still makes around half of their profits from trademark Coke. They've obviously got Fanta and juices and all the various things. But the other almost more important thing is Coca-Cola's distribution system. Because to replicate that distribution system is almost impossible. I mean, you can go anywhere, basically anywhere in the world, and there'll be a little Coke stand. So they can get their product out better than anyone else, and they can plug new products in there. So as we're seeing, people are moving away from unhealthy, fizzy drinks. So what does Coke do? They buy a, a juice company. They buy um, that vitamin water company. Mm -hmm. You've got the distribution system. Just plug the next product uh, across there. So the, the, the brand does certainly drive trademark Coca-Cola, but the distribution system I is an additional barrier to entry. So Nick, you, you choose stocks on the basis of this high barrier to entry, so you say it, it means that their margins are secured for at least the foreseeable future, it's not guaranteed forever, so earnings sustainability. So what are your stock picks within this category? Well, pretty much, pretty much every business that, that we own has some form of barrier to entry. Um, perhaps the best way of illustrating it is to look at some companies that don't. So in the, in the resource space, iron ore, Someone may, some people may shoot me for saying it, but you know, yes, I know iron ore is controlled by three or four or five big resource companies, but the reality is there's quite a lot of iron ore out there, and we've seen that in the last few years because there's massive amounts of supply coming on. That's going to hit margins unless China really continues consuming. So th that, that's, uh, that's one of the worries. So yeah, we, we like companies that have high barriers. So if, you, if you're looking in the, in the resource space, that's why we've chatted so many times about platinum, mm. because platinum supply is concentrated. Um, in the technology sector, Microsoft is, is something that, that we really, really like. So they make around half their earnings from, um, from Microsoft Office and the rest from Windows. So even if Windows bombs, you're actually, you know, people are unlikely, e even the Microsoft haters still use Office, and Office will eventually get onto the iPad and, and people will use it. And, and the stock is priced, most importantly, at around 10, 11 times earnings with something like 20% of the market cap in net cash on the balance sheet. So the real concern is it's much easier to identify the companies with high barriers to entry, but finding them at the right price is, is obviously the, the tougher part. Nick, just in terms of the barriers to entry in our local domestic uh, equity market, uh, are there any picks there that you say are, are on a par with the likes of a Microsoft that offer real uh, moats, as you call them, that, that just can't be scaled by competitors? Yeah, uh, cigarette companies, uh, British American Tobacco. So a lot of people often say, oh, regulation, I don't, like, I don't like this industry because it's so heavily regulated. We love heavily regulated industries because the heavier the regulation is, the harder it is for anyone else to, to get there. So in, this, in the tobacco industry, it's heavily regulated and you're not allowed to advertise. So how is a new competitor ever going to come and get in there? Because you can't advertise. So that's great. The cigarette companies have actually been given a blessing by the regulators because if there's advertising, you'd, you'd definitely have more competition. Um, 
Then uh, casino companies are another one. There, there are around 41 or 42 casino licenses in the country. Those have pretty much all been given out. So it's very tough to get any new casinos out there. So that, those are great businesses. What do you make of the, the telecom providers in the form of MTN and Vodacom? Have they got, uh, and Telcom, have they got uh, entrenched uh, moats? They, they do. They've, they've got great barriers to entry. The problem is they're priced for it as most of these great businesses are, much like British American Tobacco is starting to become now with, with the rally in their share price. So fantastic businesses, but as always, if you pay too much for that, you're going to get a poor return. Um, so yeah, the local telecom providers, are unfortunately, th they're priced for it already. Th there are some telecom opportunities um, internationally that, that are a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. So to, to really just th summarize the thesis from, from the way you operate is that you look for these great businesses that have moats, and then you wait for bad news to come along which knocks the share prices down a little bit and then you take the opportunity to buy them because obviously there's many people that recognize that they have moats so how do you make the distinction between something that affects the business and something that's just more superficial yeah and that and that that's the absolute key so you could get businesses that are fundamentally you know that moat is no longer there um, and and obviously that's you know what's commonly known as the value trap so it looks cheap but it's cheap for a reason, because it's going on a business, maybe your old traditional newspaper companies, that kind of yes. thing. So you need, you need to find something that is, um, it has a high moat, is under pressure, but it, you know, fundamentally that moat's not going to disappear. And, yes. and that's really the key to, to this, is, is finding those businesses and making a distinction.